So we'll go ahead and get started and let the stragglers come in. Um, it's my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Nick Sorrell. Um, he's coming to us from Iowa State University, where he's been an assistant professor of animal breeding and genetics since 2017. Uh, Dr. Sorrell received his master's and his bachelor's from the Federal University of the Sosa uh, down in Brazil. He then went on to do his PhD at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Following that, he did a postdoc at Iowa State University in their animal breeding and genomic genetics group. Um, after that, he moved to North Carolina State University, where he was there for about a year and a half before Iowa State snatched him back, um, where he's been ever since. I miss, I miss the snow. <laughs> well, if you do decide to ever come here. Okay. Here. <laughs> no, um, no, no. But anyway, um, he's going to talk to us today about some of the work he's been doing on statistical training in animal science. So take it away. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. <clears throat> Thank you, you know, for the invitation to begin with, uh, having the opportunity to come to uh, different school, different audience, and talk a little bit about what we have been doing in a topic that's certainly not the most exciting to most people. But the idea here is not to overwhelm with the statistics or to point out everything that people do wrong, learn that we cannot change, right? What old dogs, so, but perhaps the next generation can see things a bit different, okay? Um, so thank you so much for you know, finding time in your schedule to come here. Yes, I'm a breeder. Um, I'm actually officially a swine geneticist, uh, although I'm glad that they never list this in the website. Has kind of narrows things a bit, and I started my my world in genetics, my geneticist life, when I was an undergrad student, doing you know DNA extraction, RNA, PCR stuff, you know, like doing more record work. And when I was asked to try to go to grad school, you know, there for by my mentor. I started thinking, you know, okay, I understand this. I think it's cool, but I think that quite soon there will be a machine doing this instead of be much cheaper. And the way that technology is moving, I think that there will be so much data in the future and someone needs to know how to deal with it. And since genetics has been, let's say, traditionally an area that has generated lots of lots of data, think of genotyping. 50k SNPs, so 50,000 genetic markers for a single animal, multiplied by 2,000, so forth. I said, well, I think I want to work more with stats. That made much more sense to me, far more sense to me than why this gene is expressed. Now, I see two, the same sequence, and this is expressed, this is not. And then I thought, well, this is cool. And my excitement was not shared with me uh, in the University of Illinois when we were grad students. And I said, come on, guys, that's so cool. I said, I don't know, I, I know stats. And so, so over the years, you know, I've been using my experience and my interest in, in stats, trying to see, hey, we're animal scientists, and this department has more than animal scientists, right? And are we there? Are we in the right place? Okay. So we have created a so is this project here that I'll discuss today. But before I get to the project per se, he was working until very soon. Okay, got it. So the beauty of statistics is that it doesn't matter where which area you work. In the end, we're often after. There is no way, unless it's a review paper and so forth, or a case study. In general, any paper that you download, that you read, you need to have a sort of a statistical analysis in order to validate whatever you found. That's one way of defending your findings. And that means that supposedly, 
everyone knows stats enough, right? I know how to write in English. I know how to speak in English, but am I the best writer in English? Am I the best speaker? Certainly not. I have two daughters that love to make fun of my accent. Love to make fun of my mistakes. <laughs> yeah, right? It's nonstop. So why can we acknowledge that and ask for help, right? But one thing that happens in statistics, and I'll perhaps moving more to graduate students, and how there is this anxiety. This is true. This is research. Okay. There is something called stats anxiety. Because, well, they never know enough. I lose this all the time. I never know enough. Right, the students don't think that they have the proper math skills to understand what we're talking about. And I don't blame them. You know, I don't blame them at all. And because of that, because they cannot, you know, they feel that they don't know enough and therefore they cannot read things as they think they should know, then they start having some issues with statistical data interpretation. And that's seen all the time, all the time from very small misinterpretations to very uh, significant, let's put it that way, misinterpretations. And, the, and one of the interesting things about it is that perhaps animal scientists ignore the importance of animal scientists to statistics. So Chris spent some years in Cornell where this big guy here made his career. And as someone from Iowa State, we're extremely proud of Charles Henderson. Not from Iowa State, as someone from the Department of Animal Science, very proud of Charles Henderson. As a member of the Animal Breeding Genetics, we're proud of him because he was a PhD student in Animal Breeding Genetics. And he was the person that created the mixed models. The product mixed exists because of animal scientists. People, most people do not know that. And one of his students, Chai Searle from New Zealand, was able to understand Charles Anderson and revolutionized statistics because he transformed all of the great ideas from Charles Anderson into matrix. Right. And why is this important? Because of their, their work, no, I'm, I have never seen any of this, but people <laughs> tell me that that's how people used to do stats, right? But as things moved to matrices, it was much easier to make this jump to computers. And that's pretty much how we do things nowadays, right? We go to stats, we go to R, we go to SPSS. You don't have to punch these cards and then you trip and then the order of the cards are, <laughs> you have to go back. And or said, here are the results, and your advisor says, I don't like it. Run it again. It's, oh, it took me five days just to organize the cards. No, now you can do it. There is no reason for you not to update your advice, your mentors, uh, not not to update your mentor with new results in 30 minutes. Since yeah. so, we can do that. But what what has been the issue? And that's the part that I say about. What I've seen and what led me to then present this today. But I remember when I was a grad student in Illinois. So I, I got there fall of 2009. So after I had one year there, I was already feeling, feeling um, comfortable in sharing my opinions. You know, I realized that people used to talk about props. Yeah, yeah, I analyzed the data properly because I use prop clinics. I can get the same results with Proglimix, GLM mix, or doing by hand. It doesn't matter. I want to know what's your fixed effect, what's your random effect, what's categorical, what's the covariance structure among your random effects, and those things. Because if I understand this, okay, you're doing stats properly. However, our area, and this is just an example, Journal of Animal of Dairy Science, is heavily, heavily 
bias towards SAS. And it's fine, they can always publish using other stuff. Yeah, usually that's not an issue. But it's very hard to find a paper that actually describes what stats was actually done without talking in the SAS way. So I think because of this idea, it is quite common to find many mistakes. So well, using correlations when there was really a treatment effect or not separating means or you know, assuming that something's categorical and is clearly continuous and so forth. We see mistakes all the time. And that brings the idea of right what we have been discussing here. Speaking a language that is not statistics. People write things as far as I use this R package. And when someone says R package, it sounds so cool that you don't even try to question if that's right or wrong. Oh, that's an R user, that person knows code, right? But that reminds me of you know, without religion or whatever here, it just reminds me of this tale here, okay? The Tower of Babel or Babel, the bell, depending on what's your, where you come from. And if you don't know the story of the Tower of Babel is that we humans, right, try to read, uh, construct a tower to reach God. God knowing about that, made sure that no one could understand each other and created the different languages. That's where from the idea that we have different languages. I speak Portuguese, English, and that's it. My daughter speaks English, Portuguese, and too. And that's it. I am able to communicate with some of these languages. But when I go to a paper, and if I'm a size user, go to a R user paper, I am not able to understand what that person did statistically. And vice versa. So one of the biggest issues, biggest issues about talking the stats language. And guess what? We are in 2020, and many things, many things that happen to now. Of course, the next generation. That's how it always works, right? If you're getting your PhD now, you need to know everything that your advisor knew plus those 30 years of technological advances since your advisor went to grad school. So yeah, there'll be always new challenges, always new challenges. And what are our current grad students, what are the challenges that our grad students are seeing? This thing called big data. What is this? What is big data? Right now, I can just put a sensor next to the animal that will collect the temperature of that animal every second. Or a ruminant uh, rumination power. I know how many minutes my cow is ruminating. Great. And so what? Are you increasing your statistical power because of more data? Not necessarily. What happens generally is this idea from long to wide data. So like this. Usually that's how our data set looks like. We have n rows. How many animals we have, and we have p columns. How many traits we have? So when someone does big data, that's what usually happens. You keep the same number of individuals, but now instead of having average daily gain fitting t, so forth, you have O T U one, O T U two, O T U three, O T U seven thousand, and it continues going like this, right? But the number of animals remain the same. Does that mean that because you're using big data, you have more power? No, all of those things are correlated. It doesn't work like that. You know, you have, we create this misconception that there is more data, but no, there is no more data. All of these are correlated to each other. You measure the animal multiple times, just like taking your weight every minute. Take your weight for every minute. So, you know, I have, I don't know, not that good in math, so I need to do some calculations, right? But you're going to have lots of data by the end of the day. Now it means that you have more power. No, you have pretty much the same data repeated, I don't know how many thousand times. Okay? And because of these different sensors, automated ways of collecting data, we get really weird type of data. You now, RNA-seq, not normal. 
sensors in a non-normal proton is not normal. So you cannot just simply use prop GLM and think that things would just work fine. Okay. And finally, I think that we have the status quo that we usually simplify things, which which is fine to simplify, but always using a univariate approach. We did a app on RNA seq study. You have twenty thousand transcripts, expression twenty thousand transcripts. You have diet A and B. Then what we do? We do two thousand tests to see if A is different than B. So we're saying that that's the only thing that causes difference in the expression. What about all of these genes working together? That's the part that you know people like to talk about machine learning and so forth. And I think that's kind of the mentality that we need to make sure to have. So how we can efficiently use the so-called big data. And the other part is that, right? I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that if you're not a student, but you can still relate to it and how we kind of accept who is older than us, it says something. Well. We have always used this approach. Why are we trying to change it? Just keep doing because that's how we're blind. That's the ideal status quo. It is like this because it is in the story. So we don't even get much opportunity to try to question stuff. But a couple of years ago, I had a, a good friend talking to me about a few years ago. <laughs> Not couple anymore. Um, hey, Nick, should I block or not by initial body weight? My question was, first of all, I don't know, but why would you block? Isn't body weight a quantity? If your animal is five kilos, should this animal be in the different block than another one that is 5.1 kilos? But if that happens, so why are you considering this category? To me, it makes no sense. But eventually, I'll give you an answer. So a couple of years ago, I gave a talk at the Midwest meeting in which, you know, I, myself and some, some, some collaborators, we asked this question, hey, does it, is it important to block? And this is just a summary of, now that I saw that the, the image, it doesn't look that good, right? It's even worse. <laughs> I would, well, sorry, I need to try one thing because it was working before with a better and and I really make use of figures and lots of figures. So I will quickly try to fix this if it's fixable. And does it think it make the whole difference? Does it look better, the quality, or no? Same. It's close enough. Yeah. But the idea here is that this is the statistical power in the in the y-axis. The x-axis is the number of experimental units. And what I'm showing here in red is the power of when you do not block animals by initial body weight. When by random chance the heavier animal went to the worst diet and the bad and the lightest animal went to the best diet. Random chance, that's what Fisher told us to do. But then later on, I adjust the data. I use initial body weight as a covariate. And as a quantity, it can be a covariate. And what we see is that regardless of the scenario that is measuring how strong is the relationship between initial body weight and your response variable, like average daily gain, animals that have a greater initial body weight, they should have a greater average daily gain in general. 
So as this relationship increases, right, that's what these scenarios are. But it doesn't matter. Always the red has, even if marginally, greater statistical power than the green, which is when you block. And why? Because sometimes you're blocking for things that are not important. Do you think that the initial body weight of the animal will impact every single measurement that you take on the animal? No. So for those things, your block will use degrees of freedom, will reduce your power. When things are impacted by initial body weight, okay, things get better. But why would you limit all of the other things that you measure? Why would you spend time weighing every single animal, doing the blocking and so forth, and then much simpler approach, and you still get a better power? So can we question the status quo? Who will accept this? Not certainly not the current generation, because come on, I'm in the current generation, I know everything. So that's how it works. Last year, I gave again a Midwest meeting is a good place that I can try these things. That I had someone talking to me or try to convince me that since the R square of a given diet was greater than the other, there was a better predictive ability. High R square, I can predict things better. And I don't think it works like that. But here will be the example. Let's say that we have the super diets that as you increase the levels of this diet, the performance increases, you know, a very, very strong slope. And another diet that does not increase much. Okay? I mean, it has an effect not as large as the other. By definition, this would have a large, a larger R squared than the red one. And that's what this figure shows. What if I do this 10,000 times? What will, be the, what will be the distribution of my R squared? Well, the first one was quite high. I don't remember, I mean, 97, quite high R squared. For the second one, around 85, was lower. Okay, as the figure was showing, yes, exactly what we expect. But what about predicting a new value? Both were equally the same. Why? Because the variation was the same in the simulation that I did. Because that's what counts. Our square means nothing for prediction. Because what impacts prediction is how much variability it is. If it's highly variable, sometimes you're going to over predict sometimes by a lot or under predict by a lot. If there is very small variation, no, it's going to be a very good prediction, right? So we have these, these status quo cases that, hey, higher square is this. We always block. We don't randomize stuff. We make sure that the head is, goes there, then the other one goes here, then the other one goes here. All of those things become more standard than it should have. And we need to make sure that students are prepared to break this bias. And then how can we break this bias? Are the reviewers the ones that understand about experimental design? Are the ones that understand about statistics? So here is a collection of three different papers that It took this year, so I've been a uh, faculty member for six years. This year was the first year that I could finally publish Journal of Animal Science, because every work that I would submit there, I'll get a rejection due to statistics. So this is one of them. There was no design. Of course I did not design. It was an observation, observational study. If it's observational, there was no experimental design. There was nothing like this. Just data that has been collected for over 10 years and used. This is not a reason for rejecting. Shows limitation in understanding what is an experimental design observational study. All the results are correlations. 
if you just do control F, right, search for the word correlation, not even exists in the paper. It's an association, genotypes and phenotype. And there is a direction. If I change the genotype, I should change the phenotype. Not the other way around. So there is no correlation. But I cannot, there was more impossible to accept this work using correlation. Do not accept it, reject it. And one with your lovely uh, head of the department, entering head of the department as a collaborator, submitted to Journal of Animal Science a microbiome work that just submitted to Journal of Animal Science because I wanted that, that audience. And the reviewer said, I understood you wanted to do something, but I could not understand how you came up with that formula. Why is group and they fixed an animal rent? Naturally, if you ask these questions, you should be able to tell yourself, I don't know enough to assess the statistics. So this was rejected. <laughs> so this year, finally, you know, I had these three. And then this one here was the last, I said, very reactive, a bit too much sometimes. Send an email to the editor right away, the handling editor. I knew that person. You know, it's it's a joke. And then, you know, he's very, very kind. I would try, no, I know, you know, please, you know, you have good arguments. Uh, resubmit, say, no, I'm done with journal of animal science. Such that I'm going to contact the editor in chief. So I contacted Dr. Sally Johnson, the editor in chief, say, Sally, the first time that I talked to her, this is a joke. And here, the first paper that I find, see how many mistakes and look at the reasons why you're rejecting. I'm going to prove to you that we do not teach enough stats. And that led me to think, well, why don't I do a project that are we actually teaching statistics to our grad students? Okay. And why I'm talking about grad students? They will be reviewing my paper, and I'm tired of getting rid of that. <laughs> but, you know, be doing research, and if you don't know how to design or to analyze, you're taking a completely different and wrong path in your research. So, you know, should we you know, look at, at our mistakes, acknowledge our flaws, say, you know, are we preparing our grad students to succeed? So last year, um, around March, around April, actually, I contacted all the head of departments in the country with this project, which is called Assessing the Statistical Training in Animal Science Graduate Programs in the US. There are two parts. The first part is the one that I'm gonna focus, which was to first know what are they learning, period. What's, what's the current status? And what do they think that they know what they're doing? And maybe some of you participated. I don't know, there were four students from Montana State. And I can say the number because it's published. It's not seeing the names, and I don't know the names, but, but I'm very glad that you know, we were able to get lots of data. And the second part of this project was a subset of those students that participated in the work. 417 uh, students from about 50 institutions in the US from animal science type of programs. There was someone from chemistry that participated and said, no, you can't. It makes no sense, right? So did not, was not including the data. So 80 of these 400 participated in the second part, and now they received an exam, multiple choice exam and a practical exam. Okay. But pretty much I'm going to discuss only part one, which was published as my first Journal of Animal Science paper, it was about statistics. And ever since, I got two more, so I think they finally accepted my statistics. But from this survey, and what do you need to understand from this project, it's everything is perception. Okay. This is not something that they were measurable, their knowledge, this first part. It's a survey that they needed to say, 
Yeah, this is how much I think I know about this. But of course, also providing lots of important information about are you a PhD student, masters, how many credits of statistics and so forth. It is impossible for me to discuss everything. Okay, but I'm gonna focus on that. In general, I try we try to look at these questions that we had in three different ways. One is the questions that we're asking how students perceive their education, right? And how good by me staying in the, in the classroom is the instructor giving me information about a notebook. That was terrible, it was good. And you, you and of course, you know, there are many things playing a role of bad instructor, maybe gonna be, you know, gonna grade lowly and it's part of a survey. Luckily we had 400 and so hopefully that was enough to, to break some of these biases. The other group of questions was you know, pretty much the same questions we're now asking you. Okay, I've learned about ANOVA, but how much did I actually learn? Well, I think I'm awesome, know everything, five. Okay, it's up to you, I have to trust uh, the participants. And finally, and we give a few more, a few activities that the students say, hey, I'm very comfortable in data management, not comfortable in machine learning and whatever. So that's the overall idea. And thanks, you know, these topics were scored using a light per scale. Zero, like, as in, I have never even seen it, so it's hard for you to measure it. To five, I know everything about it, okay? The importance of the of the quality of the image should be even more clear here. It's a bit overwhelming, you know, but it was the best way that we could find out how to plot all of this. But the idea is that each of these panels have a topic in which participants support how they perceive their education on these things. And this is sorted in a way that the lowest score is the first one, and the highest score, score is the last one, okay? After statistical analysis, and the letters that we have here, in parentheses are the mean separation, not important right now. But here we have 30, 30 topics sorted from the ones that they perceive to learn the least to the ones that they perceive to learn the most. And out of these 30 topics that I'm not gonna discuss every one of them, one that catches my attention is mixed models. They're ranked numerically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven out of the 30. Of course, there are other ones that are really complex, but mixed models is one of the most complex methodologies that exists out there. Why do they think they know? Because I know properties. That's all I need to you know, mix them up. And when I teach about mixed models in, in the classroom, I say, do you know how to estimate the variance components? First question is, what is a variance component? Right. So I understand that it's a perception, but sometimes we can guess where this is coming from. And this is it's interesting how mixed models should be easier for them compared to what is this? Contrast, yeah. Mean separation, multiple testing, which are, which all of these came before mixed models. This is a very simple methodology. Another part that, uh, that I thought it was interesting is how theoretical statistics is down there. And that makes perfect sense, right? How many classes actually spend time talking about statistics compared to talking about SAS, R, and so forth? Okay. And finally, how different we have these two scores here about computer coding and data management. So data management, they, they think they have learned more about data management than computer coding. And I naturally think that those are the same thing. I only manage data. I don't open Excel. I think that's the part that, you know, I open Excel. I, I, I was taught how to use Excel, okay? And when we look up there, 
and yellow. These are all methods that we can say that are machine learning methods, methods using big data. And certainly students are not, not learning about that. Okay. So that's how they perceive that they receive their education. And the answer that we get from how they think that they know about those things is pretty much the same. I'm not gonna repeat, you know, the same thing because this is can be quite tedious. And I think that a better way of comparing the two is like this. So here we have those 30 topics. And here on the right panel, what I'm showing to you is the difference in the scores about how much they think that they learned and how much they think that they know what all they know. If it's positive, so this vertical red line shows a value of zero, so there is no difference between the scores, the average of scores. So if it's positive, it means that students think that they got a better education than what they actually know about. And I had a reviewer for this paper saying that makes no sense. But to me, it makes perfect sense. How many classes I have taken that after the classroom, <laughs> after the, the lecture, I don't, I don't understand anything. So yes, we, we even though say, hey, that's a perfect and best instructor ever. But sorry, I know nothing about women and nutrition. That's true. You know, I I know that they eat green stuff, right? But that's it. They taste good. And and numerically, the only single thing that they think that they know more actually learn is data management. Even though it's not statistically different, but that's not important. So in general, yes, students think that they, they got a better education than they actually know about the topic. That's not surprising, to be honest. Uh, very, very consistent here. And here, these are just correlations among the scores. As you can see by, by the colors here, there is no clear pattern. So correlations range actually from 0.5-ish or knowing the stat software to matrix algebra, to 0.8 about for matrix algebra. So in general, there was a positive correlation of, yes, the more I've learned in the classroom, the more I think I know. So, the, and that makes sense, okay? Okay, got it. Another, way of having an idea or looking at this, how much I know, how much I've learned and how much I know, is seeing how these different top topics group together. So this is a, a cluster analysis. So try to find groups of topics that, that they score similarly. So this is about learning the classroom. This is about knowing. The results were the same. In each of these group of questions, we got two groups of topics. We have a, a blue topic here that has ANOVA, normality, correlation, mixed models, contrasts, uh, multiple testing, mean separation, so forth. What you call this the simple stats. That's what we learned in our first stats course, right? Pretty much everything, it's in general, things that are here. Then we have another cluster of topics. Bayesian statistics, pretty much I never see forces quivering, unless it's a Bayesian force. Negative binomial, machine learning, cluster, matrix algebra, nonlinear regression. We can say that complex stats, right? So this is, so we can say that we have understood what they actually learn. Clearly they learn exactly what we expect. Linear regression, ANOVA, mean separation, and so forth. But what about all of those challenges? Well, that's not what we are teaching our students. And the other variable that I mentioned that we measure is how confident are they about doing things? Yeah, and I'm not gonna go over all of them, but interest, interesting, mixed models is one of the things that are more comfortable with, which makes sense if 
the definition of knowing mixed models is knowing prop mixed. And likewise, there are many other things that you can barely read that are supposed to be much easier. Tell me if a variable is categorical or continuous. Is it fixed or random? That's it. I mean, it's easier to do prop mix than tell them that. So you start questioning is, are we, are we doing the right thing, right? The other interesting part is the data management component. The single thing that they are more comfortable with, you cannot read here, but it's data management using Excel. Look how yellow this is, the yellower, how is this called? And here is doing the same thing, but using a stat software. Big data, you will never open Excel sheet, ever. Ever again. Okay. So what, and just like before, yeah, all of the machine learning type of procedures, they're all ranking very low and so forth. Okay. But what makes, you know, these different confidence groups, you know, what, what seems to be increasing their confidence? Yeah, we could find some things, you know, those that have greater that they perceive that know more about computer coding, yeah, they have greater confidence. They know more about mixed models, yeah, they have more confidence. And this is also interesting. Those that perceive knowing R and SAS, they're the most confident people. You know? So if you know R and SAS together, good numerically, right, greater than SAS. R was actually surprising. I thought that people, R users, I have the impression that they think they know more and more. But yes, you can even see these, these perceptions. Again, I can only say that it's perception because that's a third, okay? But like we did for the different topics, also when we're talking about some of the activities that they can do, you can also find two groups of activities, right? The easy one that you cannot read, but Ah, oh, Rachel, sorry to explain. <laughs> sorry, it sometimes hurts. <laughs> Very emotional. Um, yeah, the, the things that we are actually used to doing. Formality test, linear regression, mixed models, and things here, which can also be surprising to me, that are, let's say, the, 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 the complicated, Cluster group, writing the orthogonal contrast. Such an easy, simple, and a great tool to know. But why are we not teaching our students, or why are they not comfortable or confident in writing that? And when we're discussing this, we realize how we are always focusing on these different topics, right? Linear model, machine learning, et cetera. And then one of the collaborators said, what about these students? What do they have in common? So the same type of analysis that I talked about the cluster we did with the students. And we found two major clusters. We have students that are, these students have a very similar level of confidence in doing those things, which is different than this one. This is the one that are highly confident. Hey, I can do everything. Well, no, not much. And what are the things that they can do? You know, what, what makes them different from each other? It's pretty much what we discussed, right? Well, we cannot read, and that's terrible, right? But these students that are more confident, hey, they did take more stats courses. <laughs> they have reviewed the stats portion of their paper. But we also have some interesting stuff. They work in feeds. They work in non ruminant nutrition. They work in housing and management, health and well being, those other things. You know? um, so it becomes very complex to understand why they feel confident. Just, just because, hey, how can I work with feeds that makes me more stats 
company. I don't understand why. And so that's one of the limitations of working with, with, with survey data. And that's the important part of, or the importance of the second part of this project in which, you know, 80 students out of the 400, they took two exams, multiple choice exam and a practical exam. I'm gonna discuss just a few results from the multiple choice. We still, we're still grading the other one, okay? But when I look at the multiple choice exam, this is the distribution of the grades. Uh, the average was 56%, ranging from 26 to 87. If this was an actual course, no one would have gotten an A, which is funny. And I never curve, so yes, it wouldn't be an A. 60% would have failed. No, Nancy, I don't want to take your exam. Find I need one fewer, fewer exams for me to even better. But I wasn't expecting them to do really well because those questions were hard we were to actually replicate what we deal with in practice. Okay. But I would like to highlight what I considered the simplest question. Question number one, which was simply all we had to do was to classify a given effect as categorical or continuous as fixed or random. And here's an example. I read, if you can, that's great. But hey, I'm trying to see if there is a difference in feed intake between breeds. You know? Good. Most of them, 85% of them, said it was categorical and fixed. That's great. The second question about uh, Latin square. Right. What is a dairy cow in a Latin square? Well, certainly categorical. It cannot be a quantity. Cow one is not smaller than cow two. So it's a category. And it could have been random or fixed depending on, on, your, on your stats team, if you're more of a fixed person or a random person. Again, 74% great scores. And then you go to the part that you start being tricky with students. That's the best part, right? Which is a fetal programming study. Hey, some cows received diet A, some cows received diet B. And we don't know if those pregnant cows have a female or male fetus right, during that time. So my question is, is the sex of the calf Categorical, continuous, random, or fixed? Fixed, for sure, 40%. And this is a question that I get all the time. Well, why is fixed? There are only two sexes, male and female. But I don't know if it's going to be male or female. It's a random variable. It's nothing to do with random. Your uncertainty if it's going to be male or female has nothing to do with the effect that that has. If there are no, well, it's a random effect. There is an infinite number of levels of sex that are only two. So it's fixed. And finally, you know, when you use, you do not block, you use initial body weight. And the model, you know, less than 50% understood, first of all, it was continuous. But most of people, again, thought it was random because of the same idea. I don't know what's going to be the weight of the end. Yeah, that means that it's a random variable, but it has nothing to do with being a random effect. And okay, I'm not here to question if it was good or not. But my question is, how do these students answer how they perceived knowing about these things? How do they think that you know, let's say here, these 43% that got it right, how many of them said that they knew how to classify these variables? Okay. And so far, we have found no relationship whatsoever. Whatever they say that they know, it's nothing to do with these results. 
right? Um, yes, it is part of life and, and, and accept it, okay? But we need to start questioning, what if I had done these with those reviewers? What if they said that they know everything about correlation and so forth? Or would they acknowledge that, well, perhaps I don't know that much, right? So, so this study has two parts. Yeah, the first one is to have an idea what's going on. And we know from this that there are important things. Of course, everything is important. And of course, I work with statistics and I, I say that everything is important. But we are putting our grad students on the market and they are taking positions that they are doing their own analysis. Right? But they don't learn basic things to deal with the issues that they have. Okay. They are not comfortable with things that I would have thought should be considered easy. Just the idea of prediction. And we're using contrast. Contrast is such a very such a good tool to use. They are comfortable with things that we would have expected, but also say surprising methods. I'm I'm and I'm honest when I say that mixed model is tough. It's tough. Ramo, just doing Ramo, that's why we use computers, because doing Ramo by hand, you, you're going to want to shoot your head, you know, because it's so <laughs> And, you know, the objective measurement, we're still working on it, but we can already say that there is no relationship to what they perceive knowing what they actually from the grades that they have okay. and why is that i don't know i think that's pretty constant everything in everything right i am an ignorant in everything you know and my wife asked me to say that every single day in the morning say how do you <laughs> i don't know everything you know everything <laughs> and so forth may i may i leave the bedroom now and brew you some coffee you know <laughs> but Right, and that brings the idea of, I don't know if you guys heard of the, I forgot, the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? You are just too dumb to know that you're dumb, right? And, and I, am, I suffer with that in many ways, but I work a lot with diseases. I always have a vet. When I worked with microbiome for the first time, the first person that I contacted, Huh? Why don't we do the same with stats? Why is stats so special that you don't need to know how the statistician in your group? I don't know why, but that's the status quo. Okay. So what I think the grad students should study more to begin with speaking in the stats band. Move away from our package, uh, procs and SAS. There is no such a thing as a repeated effect. In statistics, you will never find a book of statistics saying that the repeated effect was NMOID. It's something that doesn't exist. When you do repeated, it says you're creating a covariance structure. I don't know what covariance structure is, but at least you know it's not an effect, right? It's, <laughs> that's what you're creating. You don't need to know what it does, but you need to know what it's not doing. That's the first step. Write your statistical model by hand. That's, you know, first day of class in my graduate level stats course, I write a statistical model and say, oh, that's what it is? Yes. It's not like in SAS that you put model and random, right? Many people say, well, the random effect's not part of the model because it's not in the same line. That's how SAS wants you to write. Mm -hmm. Statistical model is everything is good. Don't follow recipes, right? Um, do not use, and I have so many interesting results. Of one of the questions for the survey is, do you use codes that were available in your lab? Right. Those, those that use, they all have confidence out there. They know about everything. Well, because they're relying, but that's giving you confidence, right? And that's not the case. Right, always questioning the status quo. The block is an example. Always here. Well, I always blocked and always worked. That's fine. 
if you want it to work better, don't block. You know? Is it wrong to block? No. But if you don't block, you should be doing good, a better job. And also questioning the, the knowledge of the others, right? We, so I, had a, I had the best advisor in, in Illinois, and she knows everything and so forth. So question her, why are you saying this? I disagree. And of course, towards the end of your PhD, it's much easier for you to do that. And I'm happy right, because I'm not going to see her anymore. And so <laughs> if she doesn't like my answer, never see it again. But is the reviewer the best person to assess everything? Right? When I, and I enjoy when an editor contacts me and say, hey, Nick, can you revise just its stats part? Say, yes. So I don't want to know biologically what happens to whatever species that you're using. I can tell about the stats. But then, if you're a different person, you really want the biology, and you can say, hey, this makes no sense that you're finding an increase in this hormone and so forth. But I don't know about stats. That's fine. Focus on what you know. Need a set sport to someone else. Or well, acknowledge at least. I don't know. Okay. And finally, you know, I, I use SAS R and I have a billion windows open in my computer. One of them is SAS and two of them is R. They're always open, no one's using them. But there are tools, they're not methods. Crop mix is not a method. Um, e means the package R is not a method. These are tools. Crop mix does procedures that, could, that you can use to mix models. E means estimates expected values. And that's it. Oh, the other thing is, I've learned so much and just by trying stuff to answer my question. That's something that I think that grad students should do and see about stats, how this is easy. You just create some data and do it. It's not like in the lab. I will try to use this reagent, but we need money. With stats, no, just create your own examples and you get there. And that's it, what I have to discuss today. Sorry that it took a bit longer, but I appreciate the opportunity. I'll be glad to entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you. So the general idea that I'm getting is that students think they're cool in something because they're pointing in questions and giving me an answer, but they don't really know why they're getting it. Yeah, yeah. And I think, and that's general too, right? That's that's part of training. Right? We, we start doing things without knowing. There are some things that I don't need to know all the details to accept. When I press the letter T in my keyboard, I don't know what goes inside the computer that makes the T showing up in, in Word and I accept that. But if I'm just a user of that, I don't need to know more. Once you become the person doing that, uh, is right, or, or creating a map to type stuff, or selling a product that relies on that technology, you need to know what goes behind, right? So I think that's one of the biggest issues is that it's fine that they don't know everything and that's that's okay. But so much is focused on these parts, the tools, that they don't even know how much methods there are, just a tool. And then we start replicating because when we look around, well, it's what everybody does. And that's pretty much what I, say, I think is the major issue is that when we look around, that's the status quo. So I'm not doing it wrong. And, and we should question ourselves more. Right? Am I doing this right or wrong? Yes, I have a question. So, um... Back to your reviewer examples. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, beyond being rejected for things that should be rejected, 
the whole literature that's out there that should have been rejected. Yes. So, and many times, right, you cite the literature that did it wrong to justify the reviewer. That, oh, I'm right. This person published, so it should be right. Yes. One, one frustration that I have. It gets through, and then you review something bigger. This has been done wrong, and then the response is, well, here are five examples where it's been done exactly the same that I've done it. So, yes, not a, not a good argument. So, what, what is the solution? Um, I think that our, I, I, I've tried to, yeah. <laughs> yes. I've been working with another colleague and the editor of Journal of Animal Science to try to find more transparent ways of on the statistical part. And I mean, this is, but this problem is right beyond statistics. Of the person assessing at least your le my level. Hey, I'm rejecting. However, I think I don't know anything about the topic. Well, it makes no sense, but at least now we have data. And then the editor, the handling editor, could take that information into consideration. Is this perfect? No. Far from being perfect. Because the person can still say, I know everything about it. And then the editor could take that as, as the truth, right? But I think that there is a, a blind belief and acceptance that the reviewer knows everything. Right, and especially for the things that we don't know. When I get a reviewer that if you do, hey, hey, Carl, can you review this thing in microbiome? Whatever you say, then I trust you. Because I don't understand about how those small things can cause harm. I mean, they're just too small, but they do. So I just trust your judgment. And so I think that we should be actually asking reviewers to make a self-assessment self Yes, I I am I know enough about this to say so. I think that will at least make the reviewers you know, think again. Hey, am I being too rough, being too blind, and maybe I actually don't know that much? She has been so. Sarah Sally Johnson has been quite positive, but it does not depend only on her. There's a whole society behind that, so it's not so simple. To know that she's the next speaker in the seminars. Yeah, yeah. She has been very well because of discussion with her that this project ended up happening. You know, so where people's time, so we'll we'll stop there.